The Prime Minister has suggested that the next 25 years could be an Amrit Kaal, an opportunity for India to move to the next level. But what could India at 2047 really look like? What is a new idea of India in 2047? Are we looking at the possibility of a second republic, a new Indian republic, uh, or are we looking at perhaps more of the same? That's the question that we are going to pose and look at very specific areas where India may change dramatically over the next 25 years. Joining us now are two very special guests, Dr. Shashi Tharoor, congressman, author, public intellectual, diplomat, he's got a very long CV, and Harsh Madhusudan, author, investor, economist. Appreciate both of you joining us as we look at two sides, possibly right, left, and center. Give them a very big hand. As I said, we'll divide it into four clear segments. The first one, I'm going to be provocative right at the very outset. By 2047, will India become a Hindu Rashtra with a completely new constitution to the one that we had in 1950? Shashi Tharoor, why don't you kick off with that? Well, I think clearly it's part of the agenda of many of those in the ruling circles of our country. Uh, the truth is that the constitution we have established a certain idea of India, which is what we always refer to, one in which all citizens are equal, whatever your color, your religion, your caste, your creed, where you were born, what language you speak. If you're a citizen of India, your rights were equal. If you belong to a religion other than that professed by the majority, you could nonetheless profess your own religion and propagate it. All of this is provided for in the Constitution. And as you know, this Constitution was rejected and decried by those today we would call of the Hindutva persuasion. They argued from the very start that this was a, an Anglophile vision of India. From their point of view, India was a pristine Hindu state, and every non-Hindu here was either a guest or an interloper, a bandit. And, and for the, from their point of view, that entitled the Hindus of this country to throw these others out or relegate them to second-class citizenship. Now, the, the idea has been modified over many years of, of ideological debate and contestation within the Hindutva Sangh Parivar, but the idea core, at core remains exactly this, that we should be a Hindu Rashtra, a state by and for the Hindus, and Hindus defined as people whose motherland, fatherland, and holy land are this particular country. Now, this notion excludes obviously everybody who's not a Hindu, Sikh, or Buddhist, or Jain. Otherwise, because uh, those are the four whose holy land is also India. For everyone else, uh, you are going to live here on sufferance and on the terms that will be de decreed by the Hindutva uh, leaders. So when they say things like, well, we don't mind if you want to worship towards Mecca, but you better declare yourself to be a, a Hindu Mohammedan uh, or a Hindu Christian, that already is a transformation that others are going to find difficult to accept. So to my mind, that's the direction in which the country is heading. But you ask, will there be a new constitution? I think that's easier said than done. I don't think it's going to be that easy to rewrite a constitution, the very constitution by which everyone in the government today has sworn an oath and which is upheld, uh, whose basic structure has been upheld by successive Supreme Courts. But what the government has been able to do is, frankly, ignore some of these provisions of the Constitution as when the Prime Minister goes off and conducts a Bhumi Puja at, at Ayodhya, or when he indeed does a consecration of the laying of the, of the, the first markers for the new Parliament building. Uh, it's not in the Constitution, and certainly it can be said to even go beyond the Constitution in finding the head of government performing a religious function uh, for an institution belonging to a secular state. But if they can do that without changing the constitution, will they need to change it, Raji? No, no, you, you know, the, before I come to you, Harish, just to get this right, the constitution has been amended on several occasions, including the word secularism, which in itself was inserted into the constitution, and for 75 years, the Nehruvian vision of secularism has prevailed over other competing ideas. I'm asking you, as we look to 2047, do you believe that that Nehruvian vision of secularism will increasingly be relegated into the pages of history books and through the Constitution Amendment, we will have, by 2047, a new vision of an Indian secular republic? The word secular didn't make us secular. We are a secular country and society for thousands of years, and on top of that, 
our, our secularism is already enshrined in the Constitution without using that word. Otherwise, how do you have the right to worship? How do you have the right to profess religion? How do you have the right to propagate religion? All of these imply that the state is neutral about your religion. It's clearly at odds with the notion that we will be the land of one set of people, the Hindu Rashtra. And therefore, it seems to me, you can take the word secular out and still remain secular. No, Harsh. I, I absolutely agree with Shashi. The word secular did not make us secular. Uh, the Hindu majority made us secular. If you look at India, uh, there are two Punjabs. Uh, they are not together. Punjab, Indian Punjab is very happily with Tamil Nadu. And Indian Bengal is very happily with Gujarat. But the two Punjabs are not together and the two Bengals are not together. Why is it that? That is because India has always been a Hindu Rashtra. The difference is between Rashtra and Rajya, between nation and state. And the question is, how much does the constitution reflect it or should reflect it? And that's a legitimate debate to have. But India has always been a Hindu Rashtra. As uh, Sri Aurobindo said in his Uttarpara speech, that Sanatan Dharma, that for you, for all of us, is nationalism. Just before he retired to a life of spirituality in Pondicherry. So it, it depends how you define the word Hindu Rashtra. But in a very broad, you know, pun intended Catholic sense, small c Catholic sense, it has always been a Hindu Rashtra. Now on Hindutva, you mentioned about at the sufferance of the majority. The person who actually coined the term, well, I mean the person who popularized the term, Veer Savarkar, he was very clear that everybody will have equal individual rights in this free Hindustan. In fact, he went to the extent of saying that we might even have proportional representation at one point in the parliament and all cultural autonomy. So the person who actually popularized the term, we should be you know, decent enough to take it at the face value. It is the so-called Hindu right. I think right and left does not really apply to India, yeah, which is actually perfectly fine with secularism, that is religion-neutral personal laws, religion-neutral educational institutions, and it is the so-called secularists who want Muslim men to have four wives, at least legally, who are okay with uh, polygamy and for some and not for others. I mean, uh, you know, for Acharya Kriplani, during the Hindu court bill debate, told Nehru on his face that you, uh, you are bringing uh, monogamy for Hindus, take it from me, the Muslims are ready to have it, you're not brave enough to do it. So let us not use straw men to take the debate in the wrong direction. You, you just raised that straw man harsh yourself. Just two things very quickly. When you speak of Hindus as a nation, quoting Aurobindo, I mean, you quote Savarkar. Savarkar, by the way, said in 1937 as president of the Hindu Mahasabha that India has two nations, the Hindus and the Muslims, which is the words that were echoed three years later by Jinnah and Lahore. So the fact is that this notion of nationhood is an exclusive one. It excludes those who do not subscribe to the notion of a Hindu was, identity. Was Savarkar not proven correct by partition? <laughs> I mean, let us ask that honestly. Well, I think that... I mean, Lahore is not in India. My grandmother was born there. My wife's grandmother was, grew up in Bangladesh. That's not part of India last I checked. It is a reality, it's a lived reality, that those parts of the Indian subcontinent where Hindu majority stopped are no longer India. Perry Anderson, an academic, once attacked Nehru from the left, said wherever the Hindu majority stops, AFSPA begins. And Indian secularism is nothing but a version of Hindu confessionalism. He was attacking Nehru from the left, saying that Nehru was a crypto Hindutva figure. <laughs> so it really, and remember, Indian Union Muslim League, all India Muslim League, very much saw Nehru and Gandhi as Hindu figures. And Patel famously said in a speech, just days before Gandhi was murdered by Godse, in January 1948 in Kolkata, that what one day what changed? That all Muslim League wale Congress ban gaye. Congress was the large church, again pun not intended, Hindu party. Big tent. Hmm. It was the big tent Hindu party. No, no, but the fact is in 1947, Pakistan decided to become an Islamic Republic of Pakistan. And we Very clearly. And India didn't. Shashi Tharoor has been attacked by his own party at times for saying that India will never become a Hindu Pakistan. That's right. And you still believe that therefore there is a distinction, a firm distinction between the route that Pakistan chose and the route that India did. I ask you, looking ahead to 2047, do you believe India will move towards a point where on August 15, 2047, we will be declared as a Hindu Republic of India? There's a struggle for India's soul going on right now. There's certainly people in and close to the ruling establishment who would like to see India officially declared a Hindu Rashtra. And there are people outside who resist that for precisely the reason that, that Harsh mentioned. If you equate your nationalism with Hinduism, what happens to those who don't consider themselves Hindu, but who consider themselves Indian and nationalist and patriotic? What happens to them? What happens to 180 million Indian, uh, Indian Muslims or, or 28 million uh, Hindu Christians? I mean, uh, Indian Christians. The truth of the matter at the end of the day is you either have a notion of Indian civilization as exclusive or have a notion of Indian civilization as inclusive. 
My notion, which indeed you're right, is this Nehru's notion as well, is that ours is a civilization to which all sorts of streams have contributed. What is that civilization? It is the Hindu civilization. Into which various streams have flowed. Exactly. So it starts off, obviously, with what is totally indigenous, but we have not been immune. Radha Look at Krishna. what you're wearing, Bhai Harsh. Now, which I, Hindu invented these clothes? I think Hinduism is universal. I think Hinduism is not just Indian. There you are. So in that case... I could do no better than quote Shashi himself. He says, Hinduism has no one founder, no right. one prophet, no one holy book, no, no one, one God, no one way of praying. He actually believes in Hindu exceptionalism. I am arguing his point of view. I am simply saying you have to defend... You have to defend Hinduism. You can, call, you can quote Karl Popper if you're not okay with Savarkar. I can quote Karl Popper, Open Society and Its Enemies, saying that sometimes you have to stop tolerating the intolerant. We are, let's, let's stop being abstract. There are people who are ostensibly being oppressed, going out on the street saying, Sir uh, Tansi Juda, if you disrespect the Prophet. And then we have comparisons of Hindu India with Nazi Germany. I don't remember Jews going out on the street saying they will go and behead Gentiles. <laughs> so let us be very clear that we, this is nothing but gaslighting people who are actually being, actually being scared, and not just Hindus, liberal Muslims, reformist Muslims, Muslims who came out and said, let's be for free speech, either during the Charlie Hebdo case or during the Nupur Sharma case, they were beaten by Muslims, and both BJP and non-BJP governments let them go and rot in jail, or they had to go underground. It is a collective failure. I'm not arguing on behalf of a party. Hmm. The Indian state has let go of the minority within the minority, the liberal reformist Muslim, however rare that creature may be. Maybe it's not so rare, maybe they just don't speak out much for understandable reasons. And unfortunately, the Congress party or the broader opposition has made peace with obscurantist elements in Indian minorities, which, by the way, are the global majorities. Indians forget that we are not the all the world. We are the last surviving, quote-unquote, pagan civilization. Even the Chinese are officially communist. The entire world has been at least converted to Christianity or Islam, including Southern Africa in the last hundred years. I wrote an essay on Dharmatva, which Shashi promoted, just like he promoted my book, co-authored with Rajiv and you, I defend you. One of the very few people, I must say, in Indian politics who actually debates with all people. So thank you, Shashi, for that. But, and I, I really believe that we cannot understand India without looking at the world at large. And global Islam is going through a crisis. Indian Islam is only one section of that. Since the 1970s, there has been a massive increase in Islamic radicalization. You can go to Kerala, you can go to any part in what you would not see earlier, you hmm. see right now, in dresses, in, am I wrong, Shashi? No, no, dude, I've written about this, so I know what you're so, talking about, but the truth is... And you're, why you're, we you're allied with IUML in your UDF. IUML you know, in, in a way, in a way, somewhere, the crisis, in a, uh, in a way, of the Congress party is being almost equated with the crisis of Indian secularism. Uh, you know, it, it, today's a decent have, day. Have, have, you know, today one of your leaders, your sort of so-called Kashmiri Muslim face, Gulam Nabi Azad, has left your party. Left your party angrily. Uh, you yeah. know, so I think what has happened, it appears, almost that the decline of the Congress, which many believe by 2047 may not even be around, or maybe a much weakened force, uh, leads people to believe that will we in a way, continue to embrace the Congress's vision of secularism, or are we now moving to a more BJPI's Hindutva view of, of, of our constitutional republic? I think that's what I'm asking. In the next 25 years, do you Look, see those forces getting momentum as you and your party get weakened? As I say, the Congress view of secularism is actually, by and large, the majority Indian view. And let's not forget that... It the, got warped by uh, vote bank politics. In the polls. It, got wo it got warped by vote bank politics of majority communalism and minority. You, you ran with the look, secular hair and hunted with the communal okay, hound. You know how long I've been in the Congress? 13 years. And in these 13 years, I have never had any truck with communalism by any faith. I have not hesitated to criticize uh, majority communalism and I've not hesitated to create, to criticize minority communalism. My view very simply is we've got to live together. I mean, I am a deep bhakta Vivekanand, who taught us very simply that Hinduism is not just about tolerance, it is about acceptance. The tolerant guy is basically very it's patronizing. also ready to fight for Hinduism, you yeah. remember, right? Yeah, yeah. If so, you try so, to forcibly convert me, I'll go and actually fight you. No, but so, what, so what is the idea, of, Tagore, what is the idea of Hinduism he's talking about? He said, I mean, what is tolerance? Tolerance says, I have the truth, you are in error, but I will indulge you in your right to be yeah, wrong. Believe in mutual Whereas, respect. exactly, acceptance says, I believe I have the truth, you believe you have the truth, I will respect your truth, 
please respect Hinduism my... Hinduism is exceptional in that way, and Absolutely. therefore, to that's preserve what, the Hindu character of so Indian So that's not just Congress secularism, boss. That's what our civilization, in my view, is all about. But if you have a different view that says that, that you reduce the Hindu identity to that of the British football hooligan, and you say, if you don't support no, my team, I'll bash you on the head. Man. That's but, not Hindu. No, no, but, but Harish, as, as we end this segment, the question arises, is this going to become more and more of what is described as a majoritarian country? As you move ahead, where, in a sense, we have a parliament... I'll answer you that very simply. Where we have a parliament, for example, where the, the party ruling the country with more than 400 MPs between the two houses doesn't have a single Muslim MP today. No, now, does that worry you? Should we be worried that the fact is we have one of the largest Muslim populations in the world and somewhere or the other, every day there is a dog whistle or some element of demonization. Will that increase, intensify going into 2047? First of all, the demonization is both ways. Like Sartan Sajuda, I just recounted to you. So it's not one way. Secondly, India is the only democracy worth its name between Israel and South Korea. Again, it's not a coincidence that it's a Hindu majority in this part of the world. Now to answer your question, I fully agree and I'm worried. I want to see a strong opposition. However, to see a strong opposition, the Congress, or whatever replaces the Congress, will have to give ground on the Uniform Civil Code on 370. The Congress party has still not accepted the abrogation of 370. Kejriwal was smart enough at least to rhetorically accept it. Now, if today I, as a median voter who is not a member of any political party, by the way, I cannot trust the Indian National Congress to preserve and defend the Indian national interests despite their massive Hori lineage, because currently, the people who are on charge, they just don't inspire their confidence. You know, but, uh, but beyond the Congress and BJP, Shashi, Shashi Tharoor, <laughs> Uniform Civil Code, inevitably, in the next 25 years, you know, do you believe that a Uniform Civil Code is almost inevitable, given the fact that if you want equality of citizenship, have equal laws. Why should we, 1950s Directive India, principles of the Constitution. where there were concerns post-partition that Nehru may have expressed, which is why a particular direction was taken by the Indian Republic, is very different from India in 2022. Do you believe a uniform civil code is an idea whose time has come? Look, Nehru said himself it's a very desirable objective. But he also said you've got to take people along with you. He had so many difficulties passing the Hindu Code, code Bill. You remember Ambedkar resigning over it. You know, the fact is that when reforming religious personal law is the most difficult thing in a traditional hidebound society, change comes gradually. But you, you, believe, you believe it should. He said 370 was a temporary provision. What we objected to, I spoke for the Congress and the Lok Sabha, was the way in which this was done and the manner in which it was conducted and the precedence yeah, yeah, It reminds me of St. Augustine who said, God give me chastity but not yet. You know, the Congress's position on the common civil court, the secular civil court, and I don't think the Congress is a party of secularism. It's a very bastardized version of pseudo-secularism. Sorry to be very clear. Uh, Panth nirpeksh is the dharmic sense of secularism, not dharma nirpeksh. You yeah. cannot be neutral to dharma. Yeah. You have to be Panth nirpeksh. You're not Panth nirpeksh if you have different laws. Show me the religion, I'll show you the law. That is not secular anywhere in the world. Why is the Congress party either opposing it or Shashi, when he has to speak in you know, more global audiences said, we agree with it, but we won't do it just yet. Why don't you get ahead of the train so that people say, wait a second, this Congress party we can trust. And by the way, the Indian Muslims will vote for the party who can get moderate Hindus. Because if you become the de facto Muslim League, even the Muslims will not vote for you. Because you're not electable. That's the only way to actually have a strong opposition in the country. For your own survival, you must actually become electable. You know, so, so Shashi... I've won my last three elections, okay? So, 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 Shashi, you agree with Nehru when he said a uniform civil code is desirable? Yeah, yeah. But do you also agree that therefore in 2022 we need to have a relook at it? And maybe look at it over the next 25 years as one of the objectives to try and build a more inclusive society, but have it, equal it, laws. It shouldn't be a majoritarian code. It should be one that takes into account the views of all religions. I mean, they've been the attempts. Sure. You know, they go, you come from, come from Goa, there's a uniform exactly. civil code there. So it's already See done. See how that worked. That's a, get, get elements that work. No, no, but the elements of Portuguese law there that won't apply in the rest of India. Uh, similarly, now we, we understand there's an experiment being attempted in Uttarakhand. But, you know, Uttarakhand doesn't have too many minorities. Mm -hmm. The challenge is going to be to take the interests of all groups in a diverse and plural society into account. That's mm -hmm. all we're saying. Hindu court has already been constantly reformed. They're increasingly there is gender equality in inheritance, in marriage, Thank in all the matters. the Supreme Court decisions. And I fully support it. And the BJP which is in power has not once tried to reverse anything introduced by Nehru, Ambedkar, Supreme Court. If at all, they've gone the more quote-unquote progressive direction saying we should have minimum age of marriages 21 including for women. 
Uh, but the problem is society cannot run in parallel tracks. You cannot have Indian Muslim girls being allowed to marry at 13 because they've achieved puberty, because that's what Fatwa Alamgari says as per the Supreme Court. But Indian Hindu girls can only marry at 21. Did Similarly, you? if I support, for example, going as opinion changes, same-sex marriage, but not under the Hindu marriage law, under a uniform civil code. Let consenting adults live a life of dignity. But you cannot put all the reform on the Hindus and say, by the way, a 13-year-old Muslim girl can marry if she wants, and that husband can have three more wives. And that is the law of the land. Whether or not it happens on the ground, I agree. We should not demonize our Muslim brothers and sisters. Most of them do not actually do this on the ground. If that is the reality, then why it's even more important for the Congress to get ahead and say, let me take ownership of this reform. What is stopping you? You know, Shashi Tharoor is caught between the devil and the deep blue sea. Because, you know, <laughs> which one are you? He, you know, he, you know, he's he's a Congress politician. He's sea. a Congress politician and a public intellectual. And sometimes those two self images tend to collide. No, so when I'm you, not a Congress you know, spokesman. When you spoke Rajiv. of a uniform civil code, I could see the smile on Shashi almost in agreement. But at the same time, worried that what will my party say? Will I be the next in line to leave the party? Should that happen? I, Listen, I, I'm not a party spokesman. You asked me to here to speak in my own capacity, and I'm sure. doing that. Yeah, sure. So I'm telling you what I believe. Yeah, well, I'm glad to know that you, you do believe that a uniform civil code is desirable, but it should be done through a process of consultation. Exactly. Am I correct? Correct. Okay, I think your party will live with that. Uh, I, I thank think, you for the I think he should do a palace coup in the party and take over the party. I see him as an excellent shadow prime minister, if not exactly prime minister yet. Should I be asking that question here? Whether I, can we move on to the idea of India? <laughs> whether Shashi Dharur wants to contest as a leader, a future leader of the party, has been asked before. Uh, but, you know, linked to that, uh, just since we are looking ahead to 2047, one more fear that is expressed is that by 2047, we could either be a single party autocracy, or we could be a country where, for example, the southern states are increasingly anxious that they are not getting their due in terms of the economic benefits being equally distributed across the state. And they, are, they are the major tax-paying states of this country. They are the economically progressive states, but they're actually losing out when you talk of fiscal federalism. Do you believe we will be more unified come 2047, or do you see still the possibility of parts of India exercising their right to, in a way, express their freedom from Delhi? That we will have to now understand that we are different Indias moving in different directions. Look, we're all committed to the unity of India, but I think it requires statesmanship in Delhi as well. You don't have to wait till 2047. In 2026, the 84th Amendment expires, and thereafter, the government is free to redraw the looks of our constituencies. Now, they can either do it in a way that they can say strictly respects the increased population in the Hindi belt, and give themselves, because they're all very strong in the Hindi belt, the ruling party, give themselves a two-thirds majority in the Lok Sabha, or they can say we've got to find arrangements that take the rest of the country along. Because if they do give themselves that two-thirds majority, and the first opportunity to declare Hindi to be the national language, thereby disempowering the non-Hindi speakers, thereby declare a Hindu Rashtra, thereby disempowering the non-Hindu non believers, and so on. If they do all of that, you will have a serious crisis of allegiance. Because there will be people in the South saying, why do we want to be part of this experiment? Frankly, these are issues that people in the North have to be much more sensitive to. But if they have the wisdom and the statesmanship to say, we can make adjustments, but we don't have to put ourselves in a position where people will need to fear that, you know, Aryavarat has been recreated in the North and everybody else is a supplicant, subjugated kingdom, as in the bad old days. If they don't do that, they show statesmanship. There's no reason why we shouldn't be a triumphant, unified, and, and successful country. Harsh, do you I, agree I, with that? No, or, I, I, or, or do you think that there are these general, there are real cleavages that are emerging in India between states that, for example, are rapidly pushing towards possible double digit growth versus states which are struggling with, with population, with uh, resources, with, uh, with industrialization? So you've got two Indias or multiple Indias. You perhaps always have had them. But the inequalities, if anything, are only growing between North and South in particular. I think there are multiple aspects there. We are seeing early signs of economic convergence between the states, coastal, broadly South and West, and the interior, North and East. We are seeing early signs of convergence, Uttar Pradesh uh, most prominently. But to answer it broadly, I think the fault lines are actually healing gradually instead of becoming worse. For example, look at southern movies doing so well all over the country. Hmm. Look at the fact that it is so easy for somebody to plug and play, relocate from Kolkata to Bangalore to Mumbai to Delhi and vice versa. 
that kind of broad basing of the middle class kind of fungibility was not there earlier. Earlier it was the ICS and the IAS, which actually, and you know, before that, you could argue the Brahmins of the country, the sacred geography. You know, somebody would go and be a Pandit in Uttarkashi from the south or vice versa. You know, Diana Eck wrote uh, the sacred geography of India, and you could, many Indian authors wrote as well. So I, I don't agree with the notion that we are falling apart, precisely because the notion of civilizational awareness, of what keeps us united, is very much there and actually becoming stronger as the, as the fault lines of caste and language actually go less and less. There is a lot of politics on language, I will grant you that. I don't think anybody will ever declare Hindi as a national language. If at all, Sanskrit at some point could become a link language, but it is important to understand that it is the Hindi plus English, some kind of, some kind of creole there, has become the de facto language of the street mm. in most Indian cities. That is an organic process. It has not been enforced by anybody. And that is how it should be. But I, I do not support uh, having one language for the entire country. And I don't think any, anybody sensible in the BJP does so. So you... Oh, but every, every session of parliament, some BJP MP stands up and says... No, there are so many MPs. MPs. If you had so many MPs, you'd also have some people no, saying no, so, silly things. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. So, so, so let's be clear. Do you think state... The Indian state, in a sense, is behind civil society. Civil society, in its own way, is organically integrating, North and, and South are integrating. It's the Indian state which perhaps is a step behind. Do you believe that the Indian state needs to recognize, in a way, that perhaps the gap between Delhi and South India, or Thiruvananthapuram, needs to be bridged? Look, Bollywood is actually doing a better job in promoting Hindi than the Hindi Prachar Sabha. I mean, the fact is that you can have all these committees to promote Hindi coming out of Delhi. But if people need to understand some Hindi to follow their favorite films, that will be enough for them to have an incentive to acquire it. I mean, why do people like learn languages? Because it's useful for them in some way. If you make it obligatory that you can't deal with the government without knowing Hindi, or you can't deal with officialdom, you can't deal with the courts, then you have people's backs coming up. Whereas, yes, English isn't anybody's uh, uh, first language in the South or the North, but at least everyone's at an equal advantage or disadvantage. Everyone has to make the same effort to learn it. Therefore, it becomes a useful linked language. That's the concept. So basically, 2047, you see a more unified, harmonious India. I'm saying it can be possible, provided those who are ruling India show the wisdom and statesmanship required to recognize it. Basically, you're asking the public... Don't to pander to the worst elements within your ruling party movement. Basically, you're asking, make us the ruling party once again. Oh, that would be very welcome, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether, whether that will happen by 2047, but, no, you know, thank what... You. <laughs> I won't be around to find out, but thank you very much. Neither will the Congress. <laughs> you know, but the fact is, equality is the other notion which was part of our... The very basis of the Indian, first Indian Republic, was that equality of citizenship. But if you look at income inequalities, for example, and that is the big challenge, 10% of our population accounts for 58% of this country's national income. And the income inequalities have only seemed to be widening at one level. You've got this great Indian middle class that has emerged. You've got millions of people who've been lifted out of poverty, but you still have sharp income inequalities. Do you see that as one of the fractures that could widen in the next 25 years? Or do you believe that as the economy grows, the fact is, we will have uh, those, those inequalities also lessening. So I think there are a couple of aspects there. Inequality per se, and then opportunity slash mobility. I think inequality, if you take a longer lens, Mughal period, British period, the Nehruvian socialist period, where, of course, a lot of the wealth at the top was not reported, by the way, because you had 97% taxes. I don't think inequality in that sense is increasing. In the last 20, 30 years, perhaps, yes. Remember, the top Indian talent pool is globally mobile. They can work in Bangalore and show up you know, inequality numbers, or they can go to San Francisco, in which case you lose the taxes, but the inequality number goes down. What would you rather have? That's one. Secondly, on, it's more important to have broad-based opportunity and socioeconomic mobility. Now, on that case, for example, uh, the fact that we are finally focusing on toilets, we're finally focusing on roads, uh, we're finally focusing on electricity at the last level, drinking water at the last level. That is actually a real investment in human capital. I mean, I say that some of the most obvious Amartya Sen ideas have actually been implemented by the Narendra Modi government. And I think one of the reasons that has happened is, let us be honest, he actually comes from the socio-economic background. It was perhaps not obvious to the earlier government that this should be done. And if, when it was being done, it was done in a very kind of noblesse oblige manner, kind of very condescending top-down manner. 
So it is very important to understand no, no, why but, was... But with due regard, Harsh, let's be honest, road infrastructure didn't start in 2014. No, no I'm not saying you know, it's, it's almost, accelerated. I mean, you know, it almost at times seems, even sometimes when I read your book, it almost as if India has, you know, the Indian Republic has got independence after 2014, which it hasn't. India, Many of these ideas were before. India also did not start in 1947, which so, is what it seems like when you listen to Nehruians. Uh, but let me just simply say that, of course, a lot of work happened earlier. But the fact that this final human capability has been bank accounts, especially sure. women getting it, the why was this not done earlier? Why was drinking water not a focus earlier? The bank accounts were done earlier, but I'm actually not going to argue on one important point. I think that if you look at the hardware of development, the ports, the roads, the infrastructure, the railways, all of these things, this government is paying attention. And I, I, I will not criticize them. They've been giving it priority. But when it comes to the software of development, the fact that you still haven't seen an improvement in uh, a, at least 250 million of our people do not have a primary health care center within five kilometers walk of their places of residence, a place where they can actually get a nurse or a doctor and medicines. So that's going to be an injustice that needs to be addressed. You need decent schools for our people. Our government schools are not decent, massive teacher absenteeism, lots of problems. So the ordinary person in India is not getting the education that will enable them to take advantage of the opportunities that the world offers them. So education and healthcare both need serious attention. Skill development for those who can't hack a conventional education. You know, why haven't we engaged the private, the private sector much more? Getting them, getting companies of a certain size to compulsorily offer vocational training if necessary with certificates attached so people can then have the capacity to move and get jobs done. These are the things that I would truly call human capital and I think that's what Amartya Sen meant as well, is talking about the things that improve the quality of life of human beings. I want every Indian to be able by 2047 to take three meals a day for granted, to be guaranteed that there will be a roof over their heads against the rain or the sun, and at the same time to be able to educate their kids, be taken care of without going bankrupt when they're sick, and have the capacity to dream of a better life for themselves and their children. That's what we need to achieve. That's true development. The roads and highways and bridges are great, they're important, but they can only work as a means to this larger end. The larger end is a better life for ordinary Indians. Let these people have a decent job, the prospect of a better one, the ability to dream and think of a better future. That, if you like, is the essential Nehruvian vision, is standing for a better future for every Indian. And that's what I believe in. Good, you're still a Nehruvian. You're, you're the last Nehruvian, uh, but in, in a way. But Harsh, there is much in what Shashi Tharoor says, that while we are focusing on the hardware, hardware of development in the last eight years, the software at times has been lost out. Education, key factor. You know, access to internet in schools is still 19% all over India. Only 14% in rural compared to 42% in urban areas. Now, I know that the task is gargantuan, but there's a sense that we still haven't paid enough attention to education and healthcare, and we were exposed rudely in this very city during the second wave of COVID, for example. The sense is that these are still critical. Do you believe that there will be a marked shift in the next 25 years towards the software that we need? Absolutely, to absolutely. And Do you I really see that happening? Absolutely, and I think it has to happen. I would say it's already happening, for example, deworming, because I worked for uh, MIT Poverty Action Lab long way back, was a massive success in India, completely underreported, which has massively increased student productivity at schools. Deworming was done at a nation level by the Modi government. Now, on education, I agree that it has been one of the less prioritized ministries. Just like Shashi conceded physical infrastructure was a good job, I would also concede that the soft part was not done very well. But, you know, they have more years, and it looks like they'll have more years in 2024 beginning as well. So we'll see where that goes. We can help I, I, I must say one thing, that actually on the health side, the digital public goods, for example, the way this vaccination was done, for now 2 billion vaccines and counting, and it is a fact that my friends in the U.S., at, they never really had this kind of e ease for their, for their verification of vaccination to go at show into the airport, etc. On the internet part, I agree, much more needs to be done. But remember, the national telecom policy of Vajpayee government is what actually led to the massive rise in internet connectivity. And right now, after geos, so it's not just the government, it's the private sector as well. We have the world's cheapest internet and the most downloaded 
gigabytes per person in the world. Now, how much of that is salubrious or not, I don't know. But a lot of good stuff is happening. Yeah, speed is too Beyond speed. out here. No, almost 40% of digital payments are coming out of India, which is yeah. quite remarkable. India has leapfrogged even China on that. So this is this has not happened without technocrats at the government, including, by the way, people like Nandan Nilikani, who are not part of the BJP, who had earlier fought a ticket on the Congress. So it's a bipartisan effort in that sense, but promoted primarily by the Modi government. So are you saying the idea of India in 2047 would be of a fully developed country? The Prime Minister in his Independence uh, Day address said that. That, you know, this is not about India becoming a developing country, but a developed country. But when I look at the numbers, we're way below. You know, look at per capita income of India, uh, 2,000 uh, odd dollars versus 12,000, which is the global average. So we are way below, and it takes about a decade to double. So we are not going to get anywhere close to what the Prime Minister's definition of a developed country by 2047 would be. My no, point is... And I, dis I disagree on that. Where do you see us, for example, in 2047? See, the per capita income dollar terms actually depends a lot on the currency exchange, which is cyclical. So let's not go into that. But primarily, you have to look at a percent Indian per capita incomes as a percentage of the global average. And we bottomed out, for example, compared to the US, at 1% in the 1990s, we're close to 3-4% right now, and it's very rapidly increasing. So it's like a classic exponential curve. It seems flat until it suddenly goes parabolic. So I would be patient on that. We are consistently having good per capita growth rate. Unlike UPA 1 and UPA 2, there have been a lot of structural reforms done. The GST could not be passed by the UPA government. It was passed by the BJP government for all its warts and all. Similarly, because of the resistance of the Chief Minister of Gujarat. That's why it wasn't passed well, by the UPA government. Well, you were not able to convince him, but he was able to convince your Chief Ministers. <laughs> why was that? Because he used because the Because where you stand on these matters depends on where you sit. And how when you prioritize in, it. When he sat in discourse, wrote his position No, no, changed. the reason is because he guaranteed five years of GST payment to the states, and that's a decision the Congress government refused to take. On GST, on IBC, is a massive reform which has totally unblocked our banking system. So these are big structural reforms, slow moving, they go through our jurisprudence, they set precedent and case. It takes a long time, but it has all happened, and there is a lot of tailwinds. I always say right now the India story as an investor, speaking as an investor right now, it's like a spring that's about to be unleashed. And there's a lot of short-term pain, a lot of long-term gain, and in this case, I'm going to eat my cooking. So, you know, I have massive skin in the game. So we'll find out. I'm, I'm, my third book is called Long India, and that's what I'm writing about. You know, Shashi Tharoor, in that sense, and as we sort of, sort of wind down, do you believe India will be a better place to live in in 2047? than it was, than it is today in 2022. I mean, if we ask this question possibly at the dawn of independence in 1947, and you looked 75 years later, you'd probably think the glass is half full and not just half empty. Your sense, do you believe India will be a better place to live in? There are serious challenges on the environmental front. I mentioned income inequalities, which are stark. Uh, there are possible north versus south challenges between states that are moving much faster than the rest. Do you believe we will be a better place to live in and therefore the idea, the new idea of India as you see it uh, in 2047 will, be, will make India a better place to live in? It could be, but it will also depend on whether we can preserve social harmony and social peace. In other words, I think on the economic front we've grown in every respect, every yardstick. I mean, Britain left us as a country with 16% literacy, 8% for women, 90% of people below the poverty line and a life expectancy of 27 We've already come a long way from there. Okay, so your literacy rate is 82%, your life expectancy is 70, your maternal and child health and mortality figures are down. Everything is, is, is by and large, uh, in a transformative position. Of course, you still have people below the poverty line who, frankly, have, have done badly in the last few years, uh, especially since demonetization and the COVID lockdown. But hopefully we can redress those and pull, pull themselves up again. But the bigger question, it seems to me, is we don't want to be a country where you ask the question, are you better off? And the answer comes, well, it depends on your, if you're a Muslim or not. Uh, I mean, the truth is, we should be a country where everyone is better off. We can be, but you've got to preserve social peace and harmony and get beyond this majoritarian communal bigotry that is poisoning the atmosphere. So you see, that, atmosphere you see that as the biggest challenge uh, over the next 25 years, preserving India's unique social uh, harmony and diversity? I, I see it right now, Rajiv. I've, I've, you know, he talked about us betraying the liberal Muslims. I have liberal Muslim friends. I have a Muslim friend who's married to a Hindu who came to me and said, my son was told by his classmates, I can't play with you because your family is Muslim. And she was in a state of shock when she told me this, and she was not the only case. 
this kind of toxicity that has gone into our society, this has to be pulled out, otherwise we're going to poison ourselves. And then, indeed, there will be a question of whether we are a better off, uh, we're leading a better life in the future or not. You know, let me just juxtapose what, you know, take forward what Shashi said in a way, because sometimes it appears our governance priorities are horribly misplaced. I drove from Bangalore to Mysuru the other day. The road was terribly potholed, potholes everywhere. And what is happening with the ruling party in Karnataka? They're taking out a Savarkar Yatra. I wonder whether where the Savarkar Yatra fits in with basic governance. We find, you know, you've got contractors accusing the government of being a 40% commission government. Now, you know, every Indian city you go to, potholes is a major problem from Mumbai to Bengaluru. This is not just about Karnataka. And then you hear of Savarkar Yatras taking place. You hear of religious processions. You hear of Muslim traders not being allowed at religious Rajdeep. festivals in Karnataka. So, you know, Harsh, you're pointing out to our civilizational greatness. But on the ground, look at the reality. We seem to be forget. You know, the average person not interested in what happened thousand years ago. He is living with the here and now. And we seem well, to have we completely actually, misplaced We are actually priority. issuing threats to each other about people who lived more than a thousand years ago. So it's, what you're saying is not factually correct. We are issuing threats to each other based on disrespect, apparent disrespect, to people who lived more than a thousand years ago. So it's... History is very much relevant, whether uh, Naipaul was absolutely correct on that. On, in terms of roads... No, if I'm, you, if I'm you, saying governance versus I'm overt you, religiosity. I'm, I'm, there is, I, I think it's a false binary. If you like good expressways, Yogi Adhanath is going to be your favorite chief minister. Uttar Pradesh by far has the largest network of expressways in India, and it's only growing by leaps and bounds. So there is no versus Savarkar there. So it's Many of those started under uh, Akhilesh Yadav also. Again, he'll get more five years so that we can discuss more expressways uh, going forward. But, but let me answer, and more seriously, let me answer this question. I think it is the unique contribution of dharma to focus on fraternity. Like, you know, the problem with Western political philosophy is we're so focused on liberty versus equality, right? Like John Rawls to now the woke politics we are seeing, they forgot what keeps societies together. Hinduism is a very kind of problematic term in the sense we don't understand what you're talking about. Radha Krishnan used to call Hinduism a commonwealth of religions, not religion, a commonwealth of religions. It is a superstructure, the operating system that allows people to live with mutual respect. People who are threatening that operating system will face resistance. And unfortunately, on the ground, it sometimes gets ugly. No, That's but Radha Krishnan's Hinduism is very different. Harish from the Hindutva that is being practiced at... You that, know, you, that, that is not, you're not understanding. No, no, the same it, people who voted for the Congress who are now voting for the BJP. Forget voting preferences must, for a moment. No, no, but it is the must. Hindutva of the political style that we are seeing today versus the philosophical, spiritual Hinduism that Radha Krishna spoke about cannot be compared. I'm just asking... I have written a couple of books about no, as, it. As, so. as, we look, as we look ahead to 2047, are we going to see the fault lines increasing based on historical battles no. that have to be fought no. over no. Tipu Sultan so for example, or over Savarkar for example, or when over Shashi, basic governance? When Shashi writes against British colonialism, remember, they were British Christian colonialists. Nobody in India thinks that we are speaking against Indian Christians. So if somebody speaks against primarily Turkic Muslims, but also Afghan, Arab, Iranian occasionally, why do we assume, assume we are speaking against Indian Muslims? The problem is if somebody today defends Aurangzeb, when we can see what is the reality of Kashi in front of our eyes, we can see the direction in which Nandi is facing. The problem is not at the past. The past is not yet past. That is the issue. There is no closure there. It's so, not past because you're not willing and to put An Indian Union Muslim League partner of the Congress in Kerala supported the decision to convert Hagia Sophia to a full mosque. Let us ask him, is he okay with Ayodhya, Kashi, Mathura being all mandirs? And if not, why not? Remember, Somnath was converted, brought back to its glory by the Congress party, by K.M. Munshi, by Mahatma Gandhi's permission. He only said, please do not use taxpayer rupees, and we did not use taxpayer rupees. It is the Congress party which has left India. India has not left the Congress party. And that's all I would like to tell Shashi. If he wants to bring back the opposition, and people like him want to bring back the opposition, stop calling people bigots. Please introspect what has gone wrong, and you will realize the fault is not in our stars, it is in ourselves. Well, I'm glad that uh, Harsh seems to have a fan club here, but the fact is, the fact is that uh, you know, almost every sentence he spoke deserves a challenge, particularly. I'm not a spokesman for the Muslim League, but they played an exemplary role when the Babri Masjid was knocked down in 92 in preserving communal peace in Kerala. Their spiritual and political leader did an amazing job of ensuring no uh, uh, 
passions were allowed to spill over in the Muslim community. I think having a Muslim party that believes in the idea of India and that actually educates women, uh, that, that supports uh, integration is actually good for India. I don't think it's a, it's a negative thing. What about thing. a Hindu party that but, does that? Yeah, and when a Hindu party does that, that's fine too. We have them But too. then by numbers, they'll win the majority. No, but it cannot be a Hindu party. You have to have first principles. It, no, no, one minute. It cannot be a Hindu party that then decides that we will ban Muslim traders from coming to religious festivals exactly. in Karnataka, which they have been doing for centuries. It will not be someone, hijab, it will not be someone who will target someone on the base of the clothes See, you the, wear, who I, you marry, I fully what you eat. Communal, are you agree with you that are, or not? You are focusing on only one aspect of the ledger. You are no. not looking at the other side of the ledger. You are not looking at violence. Look, Hush, when, you, you talked about uh, Kashi Vishwanathan. We can talk about Gyan Bhati as well and so on. The historical facts are not in dispute. The question is, if something was done wrong in 1700, should we use 2022 to settle it now? What's the harm, in, conce it What's the harm in conceding it to the Hindus today? Because the Muslims are worshipping at the spot today. What's the harm? It was meant to humiliate the Hindu majority. Let us be very blunt about it. How long are we going to Why are we taking it? down... Why do we have this inferiority complex? Why are complex? we taking down confederate statues in the southern United States? That is also passed, is it not? Why are we saying that no more statues of Lee in the southern US? We are therefore... Why is the Pope you know, going the idea, the idea of India is meant to look ahead, not that's behind. Right. That's right. You know, I sometimes wonder, wonder whether India... The idea of India does not need to look at a rear view mirror. The idea of India needs to look ahead. That's what will build a really new idea of I agree. India. There you agree. Yes. Good, we've got agreement at least on that. That we don't need to look... We don't need to look at Tipu possibly or Savarkar. We need but to look... We I keep be ignorant mind. of the past. Otherwise we'll we be don't condemned to repeat We be ignorant it. of the past. We need, don't need to settle past scores today. You know, you don't need to necessarily... Because that can lead to friction. That can be... And this is a unique country. It's perhaps the greatest country in the world. Because over the years it's accommodated all kinds of people. Jews, Parsis. Uh, you know, people have come across from across the world and embraced India. And that perhaps makes this not a new idea of India, but the old idea of India that needs refreshment. Yes. And on that note, I want to ask both of you with just 30 seconds left, what's the best thing about being Indian? Let's leave on a positive, unified note. What's the best thing, Harsh, you first, about being Indian? I think the best thing is that we are the only democracy, as I said, from Israel to Kerala. We are the vanguard state of dharma, if you will. We are the future. We will actually bring back the traditional religions, not just in India, but across the world, while being modernist. Because in Hindu dharma, or dharma more broadly, religion and science are not opposites. Modernity and tradition are not opposites. And it is this unique combination, this ability to look beyond binaries, that is the Indian gift. And if I may say so bluntly, that is the Hindu gift. That's what makes me proud. Surely the Hindu gift is also not sort of judging people on the basis of the clothes they wear, the, the, you know, what they eat, who they marry, crucially. So we, we need to recognize that that is all, you know, we have differing yeah. views possibly no, I, on, no, on no, what is Hindu don't. dharma, but we will debate that on another day. Shashi Tharoor, what's the best thing, not about being a, you know, first of all, what, what's the best thing about being a congressman at the moment? Now let me answer your question, which was about what's because the Because I was going to get a news point out of you, because, because you were also part of the G23, but this would not be the right forum to do that. That's right. So we'll find another and I, forum. I didn't come here to talk about that. You so said, give me, what the is the best thing about being Indian? Democracy, diversity acceptance of difference, inclusiveness, and a willingness to debate. I mean, we were the argumentative Indians of Amartya Sen's famous title, because throughout our history, every point of view was acceptable. You just had to argue it out. Shastrat was our tradition. So I'm glad we had a chance to argue things today. But ultimately, ultimately, the fact that you do so with respect, that you don't illegitimize the other point of view, but you, you talk things through, with a view to eventually going on and living together, that was the great strength of Indianness. I hope that that will not be undermined by those who have the good fortune to be in power today. You know, actually, there's a lovely word in Varanasi that is used again and again, and since Varanasi is always top of the mind, it's uh, Savvad, which is dialogue. So if we can move from Savvad, if we can move from Vivad to Savvad while discussing these issues of our times, maybe we will once again discover those renewed energies of a new India. On that note, Harsh, and uh, Shashi Tharoor, thank you thank very you. much for this wonderful conversation.